And uh, I now call the member for Bradfield. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. We've heard a lot from the Labor government and from the Assistant Treasurer in particular about reforms to the superannuation system. And some of the reforms recently announced are clearly sensible and uncontentious, such as improving paper flow and streamlining the back office. But there has been suspicious silence on a central issue, which is the privilege role that the union movement has in the governance of much of the superannuation sector. And there are a series of questions, Madam Deputy Speaker, which really deserve further scrutiny. I want to speak, therefore, about the role of the award system in feeding volumes of compulsory superannuation contributions into industry funds, to ask why does it make sense to give unions a privileged role in the governance of a large part of the retirement savings pool, and comment on the transparency and disclosure. Madam Deputy Speaker, as at June 2010, uh, APRA reported there was around $1.2 trillion in superannuation, of which $226 billion was held by the industry funds. Based on the APRA reported statistics, the Parliamentary Library calculates that industry funds had investment and operating expenses of 0.8 per cent of assets under management, which equates to a revenue stream of $1.8 billion a year, which the industry fund uh, segment is receiving. Madam Deputy Speaker, let me speak firstly about the role of the award system. By law, employers must pay a 9 per cent superannuation guarantee charge on behalf of the employee into a superannuation fund. Under the modern award system, there is a standard superannuation clause, which all modern awards must contain, which says that unless the employee actively exercises a choice, that payment will go into the default fund specified under the award. The vast majority of default funds are the industry funds. According to a paper prepared by the, industry, the Institute of Public Affairs in 2010, under 166 modern awards examined, there are a total of 530 funds listed as default funds and 477 were industry funds. Madam Deputy Speaker, given the reality that most employees tend to not pay much attention to their superannuation arrangements, being, an being appointed as a default fund under an award is of considerable value, as it leads to a stream of contributions being received by the fund and in turn increases the value of the pool of assets to which the expense ratio applies. Retail super funds have highlighted their concerns that the union officials who negotiate awards will tend to appoint industry funds as the default fund under modern awards, and the statistics I cited earlier show that that concern appears to be well founded. Let me ask, therefore, Madam Deputy Speaker, about the privileged role of the union movement in the governance of the superannuation system. The Australian Bureau of Statistics reports that 18 per cent of Australians in full-time work are union members. In other words, the vast majority of Australians are not union members. But despite this fact, unions continue to have a remarkably privileged role in the governance of the superannuation system. The industry funds typically have an arrangement in which the trustees are 50 per cent appointed by a union and 50 per cent appointed by employers with a nominally independent chair. Typically, the arrangement appears to be that the relevant union simply nominates the trustees to the fund and generally the fund m members do not get a say. This raises a number of questions, Madam Deputy Speaker. Why should unions have a dominant role in appointing, in appointing trustees when many members of the superannuation fund are not union members? What are the qualifications and financial experience of these trustees? And indeed, is there any requirement for them to have relevant financial experience? The more general question, if you were designing a system from scratch, why would you allocate retirement funds into a series of pools which happen to match the structure of union coverage of particular industries? And another obvious question, how are conflicts of interest to be disclosed and guarded against? For example, the Sunday Telegraph recently reported that Bernie Reardon, Secretary of the Electrical Trades Union, is also a director of the Electricity Industry Superannuation Scheme and the chairman of Future Plus Financial Services and Chifley Financial Services. Uh, now, Mr Reardon has been lobbying electricity industry employers to lift superannuation contributions to 15 per cent. Now, it's easy to see how that might be in the interest of the superannuation fund and indeed of Unions New South Wales, which receives a dividend from Chifley Financial Services. Is it necessarily in the interests of employees? If they were asked, they might very well prefer to have more cash in hand than a higher superannuation contribution. The third point I want to observe is that I've been surprised looking into this area at the relatively limited dis degree of disclosure by industry superannuation funds. Their annual reports are substantially less detailed than those issued by publicly listed companies, 
even though many of them are very large ventures, such as Australian Super with assets of $43 billion.